Hello, Intelligentsia. I'm John Jeffers here on the Jeffers Brief on the Contra Radio Network, welcoming you to another weekly episode of information that you can use. First of all, I want to say to our listeners in the Netherlands, welcome to the show. To Bahrain, welcome to the show. Canada, welcome to the show. Did I miss anybody? I'm sure I have. And of course, to you fellow Americans here in the United States, welcome to the show. Glad you're here. Glad you're listening. All right, we got some things we got to talk about here. Let me get set up. Uh, All right. Let us get started. You know, not only do I talk about, say, um, patriot issues, I also talk about survivalist issues, preppers, if you will, a nicer word, if you would. However, we're going to talk about something that's not too pleasant. And we talked about this a couple times, but really haven't really, you know, looked into it. But Urban Survival Site has come across 10 reasons you won't survive what's coming. Now, we have to ask ourselves as preppers is how prepared are we to survive a world change in disasters? And you may not be as prepared as you think that you might be. So, reason number one is poor physical health. I've talked about this before. A majority of people are simply not physically fit in this day and age. That's a fact. This is also one of the most overlooked aspects of prepping. I've talked about this. Few things will test your physical health and stamina as much as a major cataclysmic disaster. Not talk about laying on your couch, staying home. Number two, bad medical issues. If there were any medical procedures you've been postponing, the time to get those things done is now. Now. Whether it's an eye problem, surgery, or dental work. If things get bad, you may not have another chance to get those things fixed. Number three, a poor sanitation plan. In a serious grid-down disaster, utilities such as running water will no longer exist. The trash will not be picked up around your city, causing dangerous health. You need a plan to manage your waste, and dispose of it in a sanitary way so it will not contaminate your food or water sources. Number four, a lack of community knowledge. You have an awareness of who is who and who would be helpful or dangerous in your neighborhood and the general community. Remember, you cannot survive a long-term grid-down situation on your own. You just can't. Some of you say, well, sure I can. Maybe. Maybe. Remember this, my friends. you got to sleep sometime. Number five, not having enough food. Most people have around one week's worth of food stored away. At the bare minimum, you're going to need at least three months' worth of food. That's 90 days. But having six months to one year would be even better. Oh, and by the way, remember, you're not, if you're if you have a family, you got to prep for them too. That means you got to supply water, food, and everything else. So if you've got you know two kids, your wife and yourself, that's four people, right there. Do the math, figure it out. No water source. It's not enough to have a storage of water. After all, a 55-gallon drum of water would only be enough to last one person for two months at the most. You need to have a water source in case your water storage runs out. 
Number seven, a poor security plan. The average home is incredibly easy to break into. At the bare minimum, you need to replace your glass windows with more durable acrylic glass. And you should also replace your doors and locks with heavy-duty alternatives. Also, invest in an alarm system so you can detect threats arriving at your property in the first place. Number eight, financial issues. You will be more vulnerable to an economic crisis if if you are in a poor uh, financial position. At the bare minimum, you need enough savings to get you through at least six months. And I and you know what? You may want to consider precious metals as opposed to paper dollars. Number nine, lacking an off-grid power supply. Now, I've said it before, electricity is the thin veneer upon which civilization is built upon. And a long-time power outage, chances are good you'll need to give up some luxuries, unless if you have a power supply available yourself. Invest in an extra power supply. You know, generator maybe, solar panel, whatever. Whatever works for you. Number 10. No source of heat. Now, this is especially important if you live in a colder environment. Invest in warm blankets, sleeping bags, heat pads, gloves, warm clothes, candles, a wood stove with plenty of firewood. There it is. Those are 10 things that may prevent you from actually surviving... A grid down situation. What else? Oh, you know what? Let's do this too. There are seven things that you must do before you go off grid. Going off grid offers a variety of benefits, lowering stress and anxiety smaller environmental footprint, and overall better health. If you've been considering going off the grid, there are a few things you'll need to do in order to prepare. Number one, be realistic. As you plan what is essentially your new life, you should be realistic about what you can feasibly do. Some things may be out of your control or not within your available resources. You won't be able to jet off to the convenience store whenever you need a quick snack or you know, and things like that. And raising food crops takes patience. Number two, be prepared for adversity, my friends. While going off grid is not as dangerous as some believe it is, you should still prepare yourself for bad times. Things like location, weather, health risk, all pose potential threats to your homesteading. Depending on where you plan to live, the weather could be moderate year-round, or you could get all four seasons. Everyone knows winters are cold and summers are hot, but the temperatures can feel worse when expect when you know experiencing them unprepared. Inclement weather and hazardous surroundings can lead to injuries, illnesses, or worse. Having multiple first aid kits in different locations is a proactive step. You also need to make sure you get the proper first aid kit. You should also buy some first aid books for self-education. However, realizing when you might need assistance from a doctor or a hospital is critical also. Number three, factor in money. Visiting the doctor costs money. So does procuring materials and building your homestead. You'll also need to pay for tools and resources that require year-round maintenance like gardening equipment. Etc. Number four, pinpoint water sources. Know where your water sources are. Number five, you got to consider your energy sources. One of the reasons off the grid living is so sustainable is because of its limited energy usage. But you'll still need a power source if you aren't planning to live without electricity. Number six, know your food. 
Just as you have a first aid book, you should also invest in books about the plants and foods in your native environment. Because you'll be living off the land. You'll need to familiarize yourself with viable food sources. Number seven, learn about the community and wildlife. You'll see many fascinating ecosystems, cultural communities, and types of wildlife as you go off the grid. But be careful of any dangerous animals. Bunnies don't pose a threat, but a bear that finds your trash most certainly will. These are things to kind of think about before you decide to go off grid. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying it's something to think about. All right, my friends, that brings us to the end of our first segment. Stick around. We have more to come. I know you're all looking forward to it, so don't go anywhere. Be right back after this. Tired of getting censored on social media? Are you noticing less traffic to your business page or profile? Solve it by joining mumbleit.com today and experience true free speech social media. Join for free at www.mumblit.com. Experience real freedom today. Times are changing. The circus of politics, healthcare's low standards and high prices, and let's not forget food quality. What to do? Arm yourself with life change tea at getthetea.com. In a world of chemical imbalance, and poor air and water quality, it's time you make a move. Log on to getthetea.com and stock up on organic non-GMO supplements. Don't forget the tea. Cleansing your body never felt so good. And we have a brand new tea called Take Down Tea, which helps support healthy glucose. All natural body support so you can be at your best naturally. All you have to do is log on to getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. We're not a fad that comes and goes. We are the real deal. Join us and armor up. GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Changing America's health one tea bag at a time. Life is unpredictable, but you can count on Valley Food Storage to help you and your family prepare. With clean, natural, great tasting, and long lasting food storage, with our natural and nutritious freeze dried food, you'll be storing the food you love to eat. Log on to ContraRadioNetwork.com and click on the Valley Food Storage banner. Welcome back to segment two of the Jeffers Brief. Next, we are going to talk about something I think is pretty relevant to this day and time. Let's talk about nine ways to prepare for civil unrest, my friends. You know, some say, well, it can't happen here. But many never believed the pandemic would happen either. Hence, that's why you see all the people losing their minds and I got to buy all the toilet paper I can get. Civil disobedience is actually a sign of a functioning democratic society. Now Thoreau outlined civil disobedience in Walden Pond as a necessary right when expressed through passive resistance. Both Gandhi and Martin Luther King espoused passive resistance as a way to protest without causing damage or harm to others. Unfortunately, the right to free speech and to assemble in public to protest is not always governed by the calm and sound thinking of Thoreau. The benchmark for civil unrest usually occurs when a protest staged by a large gathering of people goes from uh, free speech to violent action. What motivates that action is proportional to the reason for the protest. A protest against higher local taxes does not spark the level of outrage that would lead to damage or violence. However, highly charged emotional issues driven by religion, politics, injustice, or discrimination carry an emotional charge that has resulted in civil unrest defined by riots, looting, vandalism, and violence. 
And they've happened everywhere around the world for thousands of years. Now, the coronavirus pandemic has put unprecedented stress on global economies, governments, business, and the general population. It has brought a combination of fear, uncertainty, helplessness, and anger that rarely occurs in a single country, let alone every country and culture on the planet. The standard recommendation for coping with the pandemic includes quarantines, business lockdowns, widespread testing, social distancing, and a continuing struggle to find treatments and a vaccine. As these measures continue day after day, week after week, and month after month, the stress level and frustration continue to grow. Already, we've seen demonstrations against lockdowns and protests against rules perceived as draconian by some are being challenged, ignored, and denied. In some instances, people have shown up to demonstrate bearing weapons under the protection of open carry laws. Now, as the demonstrations grow, it's only a matter of time before a weapon is accidentally discharged or an individual decides to inflame the situation. But weapons aren't necessary to spark a riot. A single broken window or a fire in the street has been the catalyst for a massive mob riots from England in 2011 to the riots that tore up the United States in the 1960s to today in the United States. So police departments have specially formed and trained riot squads to deal with civil unrest. But there's a problem that has become apparent from the past. The police are there to break up the riot and potentially arrest violent protesters. They are not there to protect individuals from harm nor protect property from damage. The military also has specialized units in training to deal with civil unrest and their rules of engagement are just as narrowly focused. Just as daunting are the occasions when the police have stepped back and not engaged with rioters. The strategy is to not inflame the situation, but control it by limiting the violence to a defined area. And that's when authority can fail. If you happen to be in that defined area, you are not only subject to any violence that ensues, but the police are not there to protect you. In fact, it may be assumed you are part of the problem and you could quickly find yourself very much on your own. In actual fact, the failure of authority, whether it's defined by the police, the government, or any other governing body, is another catalyst for frustration and anger, further fueling civil unrest, and the perfect storm continues. So, let's talk about the steps to take, to, you can take to protect yourself and your family. When confronted with the failure of government and the governing bodies and a police force that is focused more on quelling disturbances than providing personal protection, it seems apparent that some steps should be considered to protect yourself and especially your family. Now, the degree of preparation should be equal to the, to the situation, but that's almost impossible to determine. Some periods of civil unrest last for days or a couple of weeks, or in Portland, three months. In other instances, civil unrest has devolved into civil war. That's for another show. Your degree of preparation is your personal choice. Your location may be another factor as well. Historically, urban environments have been more dangerous than rural environments during times of civil unrest. Based on numerous resources cited or linked, we've come up with 10 recommendations that have evolved based on the past precedents of civil unrest. There, there are definitely more and situations vary, but we have to start somewhere. Number one, stay home. Ironically, we all have a good deal of practice with this behavior. Some of us, who have had prepping mindset for some time are well stocked and know how to manage the style of living. Others are somewhat prepared and are probably starting to realize that more stocking and preparation would be a good idea. That's right. Stock up now. Still, others are encountering this kind of situation unprepared for the long term. And this may indicate the reason for some of the hoarding and runs on common things like toilet paper and bread. Regardless of your level of preparation, now is the time to make good on an inventory and think not only about the long pandemic will keep us homebound, 
but how civil unrest may keep us home for an entirely different set of reasons. Some things to remember with regards to staying home for the long term. Food. Still go to the grocery store. Online retailers like Amazon are still offering and delivering just about anything you could need. Take the time to determine what and how much you should have stocked and stored in in terms of food. Medicine. OTC medicines, over-the-counter medicines, are treating all manner of symptoms are important to have on hand. Pharmacies are still open and it's easy to order OTC meds online. Stock up. Civil unrest can cause stores like pharmacies to close and remain closed even though they are essential services. If you rely on prescription medications for a chronic condition, ask your doctor for a 90-day refill and looking into receiving your prescriptions by U.S. mail. My friends, it's good if you can get the 90-day refill, but many times your insurance company won't fill in 90 days. Something to think about, check into. Medical supplies should also be stocked. You might want to think about how you would manage a serious medical emergency at home. In the event you can't get to a hospital, personal care, brushing your teeth, to doing the you know the laundry, walk around the house and think about what you need in order to take care of your family, and make sure you have enough on hand. An inexpensive hair trimmer might be a good idea, and a lot of us have already figured that out. A family meeting to discuss what everyone needs may be a good place to start. Clothing stores. Even the clothing sections of department stores were the first to close during the lockdowns. Think about sewing kits, fabric, and other things you may need to repair and maintain clothing. Here again, you can still shop online with other retailers, and there may not be a lot of delivery trucks showing up during a lengthy period of civil unrest. It is true. What about bug out? If you have a well-supplied bug out location in in an area that is not affected or as affected by civil unrest, you should definitely pursue that option. The key is to get there before civil unrest occurs or at least spreads. Stranded on a highway, blocked by rioters and gangs is a bad place to be. Leave quietly and only tell immediate and trusted family members or friends who are not accompanying you that you are bugging out. You gotta know what's going on. The internet, TV, radio are critical sources of information. You can even bring your zombie box, your little pocket god. For some of you out there who won't go anywhere without their little pocket god, you're my god. I love you. I take you everywhere. I tell you everything I think and I tell you everything I'm going to do. The same is true for local TV and any local newspapers that have an internet presence. Radio may be the best source for local information and alerts. It's important to stay up to date on the status of events, especially if you need to travel for any reason to help a friend or family member or take someone to the hospital. National and global news may give a good indication of the current state of events, but rarely offer real-world real-time information regarding the immediate area where you live. It doesn't matter what's happening in Germany or England. You may need to know what's happening in your city and your neighborhood. Few things to watch for as you assess any situation surrounded by civil unrest. Are specific alerts, warnings, cautions, or all clears being provided by local emergency management agencies or departments? Are there hot spots where activity is either taking place or out of control? Are there safe zones set up with police and possibly military supervision for protection for essential services? Got to think about these things. Number three, keep a low profile. If and when you do leave your home, avoid any groups, demonstrations, or activities that may or could have potential for problems. Do what you have set out to do and return home as soon as possible. In other words, stick to the mission. No mission creep. Here are some other things to think about. Avoid clothing, yard signs, bumper stickers, or any other outward communication that affiliates you with a group, organization, religion, political party, or any other hot buttons that may seem to be fueling the unrest. 
Some people choose to do this as part of the protest. Once again, that's your decision. But it may be the best way to avoid trouble is not to ask for it in the first place. Don't espouse opinions that could be perceived as confrontational. There's nothing wrong with simply being polite and concise with communication. Some people are looking for trouble and it's best not to give them an excuse to start it. Don't be a show off. Experienced preppers understand that advertising a well-stocked, supplied home or bug out location is a bad idea. Right, Terry Kaz? In the same way that everyday burglars case a proper property based on what they see. A desperate mob in time of civil unrest will be looking at things the same way. So here's some things to consider. Keep your garage door closed. Close drapes and all windows. Lock your doors and if possible, reinforce the locks or any other entry areas to your home. One recommendation is to place a chain on post across your driveway to prevent anyone from pulling in and getting too close. This is important if you have a long driveway and your house is remote or some distance from the street. Some recommendations go so far as to say you should tape black plastic garbage bags over your windows to block any inside lighting. That's up to you and depends on the level of unrest in your immediate vicinity. It could also lead to vandals or thieves thinking nobody's home. Remove any items in your yard that are visible. Put them in the garage or at least in the back of the house. Cover them up. Look, it makes sense to share with, you know, what you have with friends or family who don't live with you. But remind them to not tell the world where they got a 20-pound bag of rice or five gallons of gas. I disagree with that, and I'll tell you why. You know damn well they ridiculed you and poked fun at you and fed you all kinds of insults upon it. Screw them! They don't get your supplies, and they don't get to share with you. Yeah, it's harsh. And they have the same opportunities you have had to prep and get ready. Screw them. They get nothing and like it. That's my opinion. Avoid confrontational gatherings. Now, regardless of how strongly you feel about an idea or an issue, joining a demonstration or angry gathering will put you at risk. In a time of civil unrest, even the most benign gathering or protest can quickly take a turn for the worse, especially if there are agitators in the group intent on making trouble. Protest if you must. But if part of your responsibility is taking care of your family, you have to consider who needs you more. Never travel alone. Enough said. You need to let some people know where you're going. And this applies to any survival situation. Whenever someone goes off into the wilderness, standard practice is to inform people where you're going and when you expect to return. During a time of civil unrest, even the most civilized town becomes its own wilderness, Kenosha, Wisconsin. Safety in numbers. If you live alone, can seriously consider moving in with family or friends. This is another tough situation. Uh, some people are reluctant to invite someone from the outside into their home and risking infection. But most family members will accept the risk in a time of civil unrest. Another interesting recommendation is to park as many cars as possible in your driveway. Locked, of course. But if three or more cars appear in a driveway, it not only says somebody's home, but there are many people present to defend themselves. Number nine, you need to prepare to defend yourself. One indicator of the concern about civil unrest is the recent spike in the sales of firearms and ammunition. Using a weapon to defend your home is the worst case scenario, but may be necessary if the rule of law totally collapses. Here's a short list of considerations. Arm yourself to the degree that you feel you need based on the situation. 
Take time to familiarize yourself and all family members with your family with firearm operation safety. Understand the laws that apply to self-defense. Discuss scenarios with adult members of your family that could cause you the need to defend yourself in a basic plan. Practice your plans, not only for defense, but prepare for other dangers. Deal with medical emergencies or any other scenarios you feel need quick and timely decisions. You need to determine a safe room where children or the elderly can go uh, be safely isolated in the event violence comes to your front door. And yes, you should call 911 if you feel violence against your home is imminent. But there's a good possibility that help will take a long time to reach you. And the bottom line is, yo-yo, you're on your own. When the rule of law breaks down and civil unrest fills the streets, law enforcement will be overwhelmed. Martial law is an, inv- is an inevitability in those cases, but even then, few places will be safe. Here's a question for you intelligentsia types out there. At what point is a local government or a city, let's talk Portland or Seattle, at what point are they considered to be in rebellion against the government, to be insurrection? What has to happen? Has it already reached that point? Do the political leaders have to come out and actually say it? Did they come out and say, enough's enough, we're, we're leaving and... We're going to burn down and occupy federal territory or state property or whatever. At what point do they become in rebellion and at what is the correct response for it? Something to think about intelligentsia. Let me know. I'd be interested to hear what you guys have to think about this. All right. I've gone over a little bit on this section, but that I thought it was important to get to it. In the meantime, I'm John Jeffers. Thanks for listening. And we will talk to you again next week or sooner if something interesting pops up. And I think it's well worth putting out there. Don't forget about our... uh, Oh, hey, we got a new show coming on. I don't know when it's going to happen, but soon. We have a uh, new host. He lives in New York City. And he wants to do a show called Prepping 1.0. We'll see how that goes, but be alert. It is coming. I think we're just waiting for his first episode, and we'll get it up there. So until that time, I'm John Jeffers. Thanks for listening to me on the Contra Radio Network. Have a good one. We will see you again next week.